Well, flick through the pages of this year's programme and you can't fail to miss that a really hot topic is PFAS here. And it's becoming a growing concern. So I'm delighted now to be joined by three scientists to tell us a little bit more. Mark, Amila, Gary, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Amila, maybe you can just give us a very sort of short summary on what PFAS are and what we mean by that. Sure. So PFAS are polyfluorinated alkyl substances and They've been made since the 1950s, 1940s even, and uh, what chemically what they look like, they have a perfluoroalkyl chain, so a, CF, uh, a CF2 chain. Um, and these have been of concern because they are persistent, they are ubiquitous, and they move up food webs. Um, and so back in the day they were called PFCs, and we've recently moved to the PFAS terminology, PFAS. Um, to avoid confusion with other um, substances. And where do we find these PFAS? They are everywhere, they're ubiquitous. So they are in every environmental uh, compartment. They are in human blood all around the world, all of the continents, ocean water, freshwater lakes. If we sampled your drinking water in your home, we would find them there. If we sampled your blood, we would find them there. If we sampled your pets, um, the dust, everything. They are around us everywhere in this room. We're breathing them in right now. And, and we'll come to the impact of them in a minute, but the, the study of them, Gary, is that growing in, in speed and yeah, momentum? Yeah, it, it definitely is. Uh, people have been aware of PFAS in the environment for some time, but the recent interest has been primarily associated with human health issues and drinking water exposures, where there was a realization in certain places that these exposures were pretty significant and approaching levels that might be of concern from a health perspective. Um, but also in the last year or so, uh, there's been a lot more concern about the potential effects of these on components of the environment as well. So wildlife, fish, even plants potentially could be affected by these chemicals. And we're just starting to uh, think about how we might look at this. Well, let's just quickly talk about those impacts. And Mark, what sort of impacts are we seeing on human health from them? That's a good question. Um, the data aren't very clear. We're, we're some, there are some epidemiological studies, but they're cross-sectional, and so they really don't show cause and effect, just some correlation. And so we, we see some effects to the liver, some effects in terms of higher cholesterol, which is actually opposite than the mammalian controlled animal data. Um, could be due to things, and there have been some postulations that maybe reverse causation is the reason for some of these effects that we see in terms of high cholesterol. Maybe. That the, that the people that we're seeing high serum concentrations of PFOS is because of reduced glomerular filtration rate that could be due to other causes, for example. But uh, effects are seeing uh, thyroid, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, ulcerative colitis has been associated with high serum titers of some of these compounds. It's important to know that a lot of these compounds are incredibly variable. There's, there's branched, there's linear isomers. It's over 4,000 different chemicals. Some of these are polymers that have very short lives that aren't really biocumulative. Some of them last a long time, as Amelia said, in our biocumulative. So it's, it's a really hard group of chemicals to get your head around because they're so variable in, in the, the effects that they produce and their kinetics. And Amelia, we just heard about the human health aspect. What about the environmental aspect that, that Gary was alluding to as well? So the biggest concern about uh, PFAS from an ec ecological perspective is their persistence. So even some of the things that are, are less persistent will degrade into PFAS that are persistent. And although the um, acute toxicity ecologically is, is quite low, the fact that they're persistent, they will build up in the environment and we have various environmental sinks for them, um, that is a concern. So we have some acute toxicity data, we have some chronic toxicity data, um, but still the toxicity data is emerging. So we're looking at developmental toxicity, tests where you're exposing um, the first generation of fish to the chemical and then having them reproduce and looking at the offspring. And we're actually seeing quite significant effects in the offspring, including mortality, that you're not necessarily seeing at that same dose in the parent generation. So it sounds difficult to measure these impacts then, Gary? Um, yeah, it's a challenge two ways. Uh, first of all, they're difficult chemicals to test sometimes because they have uh, very diverse properties. But even more than that, the sheer number of them is challenging for us in terms of having adequate resources to do enough testing using conventional test methods. And so people are looking at different approaches 
both analytical chemistry approaches and biological approaches where we can look at the properties of a lot of chemicals quickly to try to decide which of this large universe of chemicals should be our priorities for uh, in-depth investigation. What would um, your key takeaways be, Mark? What would you like people to leave the meeting thinking about going forward? Yeah, an important thing that we needed to do is, was to all get together and find out what's the state of science now and where do we go from here. And so recently we had a CTAC focus topic meeting in August in Durham, North Carolina to discuss that. What is the state of the science and what we know about the environmental effects, exposure, characterization of the risk and so forth on these compounds and then actually break out in groups later and try to see what are the big things that we need to learn more about. And so we just had that recently. Uh, we're going to try to publish those results and we think that'll help us develop a roadmap on how to, to move forward on characterizing the risk from these compounds. Fantastic. Gary, would you like yeah, to add? I'd that? agree uh, that that meeting is pretty seminal in terms of getting together the experts, finding out what we don't know. Uh, summarizing that, but most importantly talking about where we need to go and how we might be able to get there in those various areas, exposure and effects in humans and in wildlife. And Amelia, what would, what would your takeaways be? For My people? takeaways would be that um, PFAS as a category are such unique com uh, contaminants and everything we know about other contaminants doesn't necessarily apply. So we really need a creative perspective on how to approach these substances. CTAC has been a wonderful forum for PFAS research since the early days, and uh, much of what we know has emerged from this meeting historically. Fantastic. Well, we'll look forward to hopefully catching up on, on this next year, maybe, and we'll see what's um, developed from then. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you very much. CTAC TV is brought to you from the CTAC North America 40th Annual Meeting. Make sure that you watch all the fantastic interviews and reports that we've been gathering here at the annual meeting on our YouTube channel.